Good morning, and welcome to worship today. It is good to gather together as we come before our God to worship and magnify his name. A special welcome this morning. If you're here for your first time or if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. We pray that you'd be blessed in our time together. A couple of announcements as we get started today. First of all, uh, just a reminder that if one of your committees or one of our ministries has a request for the 2025 budget, uh, please get in touch with one of our deacons as soon as possible uh, to get that uh, approved. Uh, and then second, a reminder of what's in the bulletin. This Tuesday night, we're going to have a night of giving. Uh, so the fellowship committee is going to host uh, the, the preparing of giving baskets to be distributed uh, to members of our church and the community uh, and those who, who can be encouraged in that way. And so um, if you're available, please come out to that. We know it's also uh, a big practice night for the gift, uh, nat live nativity, but um, Try, well, we're going to try and make this work. Somehow, some way, we're going to make that work. And so we encourage you to, to come out Tuesday night uh, for that. <clears throat> but our call to worship as we come together today is from Psalm 118. <clears throat> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Join me in prayer this morning. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we come into this place and into this time together, Lord, we are mindful of these things. We are mindful and grateful that it is you who have given us this day, this beautiful day of sunshine and rest. That it is you who have called us together with fellow believers into this place and into this time that we might raise up our voices in song and in prayer. That we might come before you humbly confessing our sins and knowing the good news of salvation and that we might hear your word preached. Oh Lord God, fill us in our time together that we might be able to go out and to serve you and to grow your kingdom with the help of your spirit. May you be glorified in our worship today. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Sing we the song of Emmanuel.
And as we are gathered and we are called into worship, we receive the greeting of our God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship in song this morning with the old rugged cross.
You may be seated. It's fitting as uh, we've been working our way through Philippians, and I think about last week, and we got to that section in chapter 3 where Paul talks about all uh, of these confidences that he would have had in the flesh as a Jewish person. All the things that, that kind of he, he would have tied up nicely with a bow and said, this is why I deserve to be favored by God. And yet we heard him say, I count it all as loss, it's all rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge or surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Right? He placed his confidence in the cross, in, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's fitting as we come into a, a time of confession of sin this morning uh, that we're turning to this part of the Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism, in its middle section, works through the different parts of the Apostles' Creed. And so it talks about God the Father, it talks about God the Son, it talks about God the Spirit. But then we get into that final section of the creed in which we confess that we believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And what the Catechism does, this document from the, the mid-1500s, uh, brings us to what is our understanding about that. What do those things matter for us? And so I invite you to use these as an opportunity to confess our faith together, but also to usher us in to a time of prayer and so if you would respond with the answers, that will be on the screen. People of God, what do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I How does the resurrection of the body comfort you? And how does that article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Finally this morning, what good does it do you to believe all this? In Christ I am righteous before God and heir to life everlasting. Join me in prayer. Oh Lord our God, as we say those words and as we sung in the hymn, Lord God, we are brought to a point of conviction of recognizing that the reason that you died on a cross wasn't simply political persecution. It wasn't just something that was unjust against an innocent man. But that, Lord God, you offered yourself as a sacrifice for our sins and for the punishment that we deserve. And, Lord God, then we are able to confess that, that it is with joy that we come before you. It is with joy for what you have done for us. It is with such great gratitude that that is never enough. And yet, Lord God, we recognize that in our day-to-day -day lives, even in this morning, that there are sins that we have committed, that there are ways that we have not loved you as you have called us to, that we have not loved our neighbor as we ought. Lord, that there are times when we have been short-tempered, that there have been times where we have thought evil or, or potentially harm against others. That there are times where we have allowed other things to take the place of our ultimate focus in praise and love. And Lord God, we pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us for, for pride and for selfishness, for idolizing ourselves or, or things into places that they should not be. 
But Lord God, we are grateful that we don't just bring these sins before you, bring our, our confession, our repentance before you, and, and wonder, will they be taken away? Will they be dealt with? But again, you have offered yourself already. The work of salvation, what is necessary for it, has been accomplished and it is finished. And so, Lord God, let us rest daily in the assurance of Jesus Christ and the assurance of grace, but continue to change our lives by your Holy Spirit living in us, that we might be renewed until the day that you take us home. All this we pray in your Son's name. Amen. As we do place our focus on Jesus and what he has done for us, let's sing as we remain seated. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. Lord gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can do just that which we sung, that we can come to you in prayer. Lord, that we can see you not just as a master or a king and, and someone who puts a, a reverent and awesome fear in us, 
but that you are a friend, that you are one who listens and who desires to hear us. You are the one who desires to call us like a, a shepherd calls to his sheep, each by name, and, and that we know your voice. And so, Lord God, we come this morning, we come before you with, with praise and adoration. Lord, for all the things that you have done, for all the blessings that, that we so often take for granted. That, Lord God, we have seen you, we confess, in our daily lives. We have seen you in the ways that you have woken us up each and every morning. That you are the one who has given us breath and that you have given us the ability to to move and, and, and to go and to do things, to, to be in families, to be in marriages, to be serving you and, and submitting with our whole lives to you. That we've been able to work, that we've been able to go to school, we've been able to play, we've been able to study and, and, and to serve your kingdom's mission. Lord, we give you thanks for the ways that, that we here have been able to be part of, of a kingdom work this week. Lord God, in the packing of, of over 600 shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child, Lord God, it is our joy and our hope that you will take them and that you, O oh Lord, not just Samaritan's Purse, not just the, the postal service or whoever is involved in shipping those, but Lord God, that, that you will send them right where they need to go, that you will send them to children and to families around the world and, and to not just send things, but to share the good news of Jesus with them. Lord, we praise you and we give you thanks for the ways that, that you work in, in sharing the good news as we think, too, of, of chaplains today, as we think of those who, who minister to your word and minister to your grace in hospitals and in workplaces and in the various branches of our armed forces. Lord God, as they take up that call to go and, and to preach and, and right there in the midst of, of daily life, especially in the midst of, of difficult circumstances, Lord God, we pray that you would lift them up, lift their spirits, and, and give them a, a boldness with which to serve you and to speak of your goodness and your grace each day of their work. But Lord God, we come before you this morning and we also raise up the things that we desire for you to do, for their needs, for our requests, for our petitions. Lord God, we continue to think of those who are struggling, those who are sick or who are weak, those who are experiencing pain, Lord God, as we once again lift up Patty to you and ask that, that you would be near unto her. We give you thanks for, again, the, the cheerfulness that you've given her. And, and, uh, but Lord God, we do ask that you would come and you would bring relief to her body as she continues to recover. Lord God, we ask that any procedures that need to take place in the future, that you would allow them to go smoothly, that you would allow her body to, to recover and, and to repair that she might be able to go on well. Lord God, we lift up to you, Glenn Kennedy, and, and Lord God, as, as he will be entering into the hospital, perhaps already has, and, and as he awaits surgery, Lord God, we pray that the surgery would be effective and that it would be complete in removing the carcinoma that he's been dealing with. Lord God, we pray that you would be with the doctors and the surgeons, the nurses that, that attend to him, and, and Lord God, may you make their actions, their hands accurate and precise in what needs to be done. Lord God, enable him to experience a, a smooth and successful recovery in the week ahead, and, and be with Sue too, Lord God. Give her your grace and your comfort and peace. Lord, we think of others as, as we continue to, to go on with life far removed from different situations that are in the world, but we know, God, that, that people continue to struggle, whether that's with with the physical needs, the material needs, and, and even home and heat and shelter and food. But also, Lord God, the emotional pain that, that exists after disasters. And as we continue to think of those who are recovering in North Carolina and Tennessee and other places that have been devastated this year by natural disasters. Lord God, as we turn on the news and, and we hear reports of, of devastation in countries like Ukraine and and throughout the Middle East. And Lord God, our, our hearts yearn and, and burn for people who, uh, who have done nothing but, but have been the victims of, of war. And it is our hope, Lord God, that you would bring restoration into their lives, that your church might be a light for them. 
that it might show the way to you, but it might also reach out and to help in providing for the needs of others. Lord God, there are so many others who are hurting with pains that are unseen and, and unshared, and, and Lord God, you know each one of them. You know among us, you know in our families, you know in our extended families, those who are in need. And so often we say, well, someone else has it so much worse. They are truly in need of prayer. And yet, Lord, we each need you. We need your provision in our life. We need your comfort and your strength. Lord, we need the renewal that you alone can provide, not just for our souls and the sin that exists, but Lord God, to be shaped into the image of you, to be able to live in in a way that is not only glorifying to you, but that is grateful to you. And so, Lord God, I pray that among young and old alike, that you will have your way among these people who are here this morning and among those who will hear this service and, and this message. Lord God, may you continue to renew us. May you continue to draw people into your kingdom. Lord God, we pray that in the preaching of your word this morning, that again, I would simply be a servant of you, that it wouldn't be about me, that it wouldn't be about my hopes or dreams or my struggles, but, but that in the weakness of a human vessel, in the weakness of speech, Lord God, that you might stir in our hearts because of your Holy Spirit and the truth of your word. Focus us on you now, that we might go and to serve you more each day. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I want to invite you forward for our children's message today. How are you guys? Yeah? Come on. Hello, Gwen. How are you? How are you? Do you see the flowers in the cornucopia? We are getting close to Thanksgiving, guys, aren't we? Yeah. Huh? Is that what you're more excited about than Thanksgiving? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. It is the roll-off thanks or it's the roll-off Thanksgiving month too, but but the roll-off birthday month. So that's exciting. Guys, I want to mention these before we get into our lesson for today. But we have up there the the Peter fish, and and for those that might not remember, the Peter fish are. Uh, a, a way to collect money for World Renew, and, and uh, the money that is collected goes to help people who are struggling with hunger around the world, not just giving them food, but uh, providing them with seeds or providing them with animals, providing them with different ways that they can have more sustainable um, practices in their communities and in their lives to, to grow food and, and to continue in that. And so we have an opportunity over the next couple weeks to help raise money for that, and so you can bring those back on Thanksgiving Day uh, or on any Sunday after that. So adults, again, if there's some left over after the service today that these kids have not grabbed, uh, feel free to, to take one home too. Hello. All right. What are you pointing at? Are you pointing at all of them? All right. Who thinks they know what C is for? Go ahead. Wrong. I know, right? That's, you would think it would... No, my kids, you, don't, you already know because I've told you. No, you don't think it's because I've told you? C is for Christian, right? That's what the book is called. But, Addy, what do you think C is for today? No, C is not for creation. That's a fair guess. Brooks? Christ? Well, C is for Christ, too, but that's not what it is. C is for citizen, all right? C is for citizen in our book today. And our citizenship is in heaven, comes from Philippians 3.20. We're going to talk a lot about that this morning. What, when you guys look at that, or, or with what you know already, what is citizenship about? Brooks? Huh? You know what, oh, you know what citizen means? What does citizen mean? A person in a town, right? A person in a place who lives somewhere. It's pretty, isn't it? Any other ideas of what citizen or citizenship is? Someone who buys their way in or, or who does something, right, to, to establish the right to be in a country. Very good. All right, so here's what it says. Everyone is a citizen of a country. It's the place where they most belong. If they have a passport, it's this country that gave them the passport, and they speak like 
and they behave like people from that country speak and behave. And so if you're an American citizen, what country do you belong to? America, right? You speak like an American, you behave like an American. Even if you travel outside America, you are still an American citizen. If you're French, then you belong to what country? France, right? And so you speak French, you behave like a French person. Even if you travel outside of France, you're still a French citizen. But Christians... <laughs> Christians are citizens also of heaven. This means the place where we most belong is not here where we live at the moment. It's heaven with Jesus. So this also means that the place where we will be most happy living is not here, but it's heaven with Jesus. At the moment, we don't live in heaven. We are in this world. But if we are followers of Jesus, we are citizens of heaven. Yes, we're still American or French or British or Brazilian citizens, but most of all, we are citizens of heaven. This will make a difference in how we speak and how we behave. We will speak kind words like Jesus and we'll act like Jesus. This will also make a difference to how we think about the world. The world is not our real home. Heaven is. Heaven is much better than anything here. That's where we belong, and that's where we're heading. How exciting. Are you going to pass those out for us? All right. All right. Yeah, it's a fish, huh? All right. Should we pray, and then she can keep passing them out? Gwen, Gwen, let's pray. We're going to pray, okay? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you have given us a home in heaven where everything is perfect and we can live with you. Please help us to remember that we belong there, not in this world. Please make us excited about living with you as citizens of heaven forever. Amen. All right, guys, you can grab a fish. And I forgot to take the candy out. You guys want candy? Of course you do. Of course you do. All right, guys. It's all right. Now you don't want the fish. All right. You're going to take one for her? Okay. Faye's got one. Show her. Golly. All right, guys. Good job, Gwen. Well, I invite us then to open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verses 12 through chapter 4, verse 1. And again, it's a God coincidence, it is his providence that we are focused on the exact same thing. That we're focused on citizenship as we come into our passage this morning. Uh, but a few weeks ago, uh, we were looking at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. And I said we would come up to citizenship there and we come up to citizenship again. Uh, we looked before at how Paul talks about citizens have a way they act, a way they live. They have a conduct, and that's connected to the gospel. But here now, as you've already heard, our citizenship is in heaven. It makes us think somewhere else. It makes us think ahead in time, uh, and that's where we're going to be today. Um, and I mentioned already the, the confidence in the flesh that Paul talked about last time. Uh, and again, we wrapped up last week's passage by talking about how, how Paul says, I'm not there yet, right? I still have work to do. There's still things to, to be done in my life. And he starts out our passage today in the exact same way. He wants to make it very clear that even for him, he's not there yet. And so let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. 
only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern that we gave you. For as I've often told you before, and now I say it again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, This is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, this may be one of the most controversial things that you have ever heard me say and that I've ever made in public, and I'm serious about that. Uh, But I struggle when it comes to one of the core pieces of of national citizenship. I struggle with saying our nation's pledge of allegiance. And let me be clear about that. It's not that I'm anti-American. It's not that I hate America. My struggle is not for the reason that many professional athletes chose to kneel during the, the national anthems just a few years ago. I'm greatly appreciative of the rights and the liberties and the freedoms and, and really luxuries and protections that I so often take for granted as a citizen of the United States of America. I understand and I respect that I have those and I get to enjoy those largely because men and women have fought and even died on our behalf. My stance, my issue is not anti-military. My political and my law enforcement views tend to be traditionally conservative and upholding laws that are in place. But I wrestle with what pledging allegiance means especially when, for most of us, it's not something that we chose, right? Unless you're an immigrant, which some of you are, we have our citizenship and this expectation of allegiance placed on us simply because of where we were born. And so to clarify, my controversial statement, no matter what would probably exist, no matter what country I was born into, it's not about America. It's about the idea of allegiance by birth. Allegiance and citizenship are such significant things when it comes to our status and our lives in this world. It is by the grace of God and his grace alone that we get to live here and call it our home. But that doesn't make it not difficult to think about the reality that there are so many in this world who live in poverty or who live in scarcity of resources or high prevalences of diseases or under corrupt governments and without freedoms just because they were born there. These things are not easy. Part of my struggle is because it seems like many people take citizenship and they take allegiance to a country as something that, that somehow they deserve it. And they take pride in their country to an idolatrous level. A level that if I were to hear them say, well, my citizenship is in heaven, I'd wonder, is it really Because it seems like you're so much more focused on earthly things than heavenly things. And to be clear, this is not an issue on the right or the left politically. It's, It's something that could be true anywhere in between those. Citizenship and allegiance are weighty things. We'll come back to that in a moment so you can try and lower your blood pressure if you're mad at me right now, but... Our first point is this. To be, let me be clear also, I do still say the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm not saying I don't, but... But this is our first point today. What and where is your prize? What and where is your prize? Right, we read last week this summary of Paul's conversion and his ongoing process of sanctification. Right, he knows the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. He knows the, the, the greatness of being found in him. He has received the righteousness by faith. He wrote of wanting to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings, attaining to the resurrection of the dead. And now he says, I'm going to press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I'm straining toward it. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize 
for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right, what is the prize there? What prize is he speaking of? Well, Paul's goal or his prize is eternal life with and in the presence of Jesus Christ. That should be the prize of every believer, that our prize would be eternal life with and in the presence of Jesus Christ. If we look back before Saul or Paul's conversion, we find actually at his first appearance the trial and the stoning of Stephen. And at the end of Acts chapter 7, we read about what he experienced. Right? They, the Sanhedrin, were furious at him. They gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus at the right hand of God. And he said that to the people, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then what is his dying prayer? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Right? Take me to be with you. And then he prayed something very similar to what Jesus prayed on the cross. Lord, do not hold their sin against them. He, his prize was being with Jesus. Right? What did Paul say earlier in this very letter that we've been working through? In Philippians 1, 21 and 23, he says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But what is the gain? I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. The prize that awaits every believer, not by our earning it, but rather by the grace of God, is the gift of eternal life with Jesus. It's to worship him, to enjoy him, to, to be with him forever. That is something that cannot properly be experienced here on this earth. Right? That is something that, that is ahead. It is at the finish line. It is when the final bell rings. It is when Christ returns even for one of the most praised and respected Christians, even they don't possess this prize yet. And that is where the second part comes in. Where is your prize? And the reality is you don't have it. And if you don't have it yet, then Paul says keep going toward it. Right? The language that Paul is using in this chapter is language that, that called to mind for the original audience the, the ancient Olympic Games or other similar games that so often involved running. Right? And if you want the prize in the games, what did it take? Well, the same thing it takes today. It takes hard work. It takes practice. It takes training. It takes focus. But just because you do all those things doesn't mean that you're going to win. You're not guaranteed a prize. You must race. You must focus and you must succeed at the finish line. John Chrysostom, one of the, the early church fathers who lived uh, back in the 300s and 400s, I've mentioned him again, he offers this really, I think, wise statement in one of his sermons. He writes, he, that, that's Paul, says not I run, but I press on. Consider how the pursuer strains in his pursuit. He sees nothing. He thrusts away all who impede him with great force. He cherishes his mind, his eye, his strength, his soul and body, looking at nothing other than the crown. Right? Do we have that focus? That eternal life with Jesus is your prize and mine. I know it's easy to take that quote and to think, well, the Christian life, it's, it's just an individual thing, right? Only one runner can really win the prize. And that's taking it too far. Right? Yes, faith is personal. Yes, you and I must fight the sin that entangles each one of us. You and I make choices for ourselves that are either more wicked or more righteous. But we run our race. We run through life with other believers too. Right? We're not trying to keep them from the prize, but to aid them and to encourage them towards it together. And so we have this calling, we have this duty to aid in the church, to keep one another's eyes fixed on Jesus. Being clear that his sacrifice on the cross is all sufficient for our salvation. That we brush back together any and all of the enemy's attacks and temptations to sin. Right? Yes, there are things that, that we might see in our lifetimes that you would say, well, that'll be nice, that would, would temporarily please me if I dropped out. Yes, turning away from Jesus feels like it could permit me to do some things that I would otherwise be restrained or restricted from. But if we leave the race, then our destiny, Paul says, is destruction. 
It's not glory. Right? Our victory is earthly and it's only temporary. It's not an eternal victory. And so do not rest. Do not turn aside. Do not neglect those who you are running with and particularly the one you're running towards. But with that, we move on to our second point. And what we see as our prize in the first point will impact how we answer this. What do your earthly and heavenly citizenships entail? What do your earthly and heavenly citizenships entail? Again, you've heard me say it at least three times probably. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. And yet, neither Paul nor Jesus, nor any of the other apostles ever fully rejected what being a citizen of an earthly country or government entailed. Right? Human government, whether made up of who we believe are wise believers or not so wise believers, they have a rightful authority that Christians have to observe. And we have all these familiar passages. Matthew twenty two twenty one. Jesus is asked, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? They're trying to trip him up and and Jesus responds, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Right? Paul himself writes to the, the believers in Rome, he says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been entrust, or established by God. Right? The apostle Peter confirms that. He agrees with Paul. 1 Peter 2, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, and honor the king. And he even presents an example just a few verses later after talking about slaves and masters, that hierarchy, that power, that Jesus is an example of doing this under persecution. And so, yes, we have earthly citizenship. Right? Most, if not all of us here this morning, we are, are citizens of St. Croix County in the state of Wisconsin. And so submit to the authorities and respect them here. Right? If you're in the United States and you're a citizen of it, submit to the authorities in this country. Right? If you are in a foreign country and they have different rules, as I've said before, don't assume that the American rules, the American laws, apply there. You are a stranger. You are a foreigner there. Remember that. Respect them and their leaders. The Belgian Confession, Article 36, really, I, I would say, has all this in mind when it says this. Everyone, regardless of status, regardless of condition, regardless of rank, must be subject to the government and pay taxes and hold its representatives in honor and respect and obey them in all things that are not in conflict with God's word, praying for them that the Lord may be willing to lead them in all their ways and that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all piety and decency. Right? That last part is not just some human ideal that we want to kind of seclude ourselves or isolate ourselves. I know it rests in 1 Timothy 2. Right? When Paul urged Christians, he urged Timothy, his son in the gospel work, to pray for kings and all those in authority, that we may live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and holiness. He then goes on to say the very next sentence, This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Right? Notice there's a connection there. If we have the opportunity to live peaceful and quiet lives, it's not just to our benefit, but we are to use that opportunity to share the gospel with others. But our citizenship here, how we live under the conditions of whatever location we're at, whatever government is in place, whatever a given leader or leaders choose to do, your and my citizenship and allegiance to the United States of America or any other country is not ultimate. It is not to be number one. It's not just about verse 20, but hear the contrast to the verses before. Right? Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny, destruction. Their God, their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is somewhere else. Our citizenship is under the authority of someone else. 
Right? The, authority, the author rather of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 13, 14, For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking to the city that is to come. Right? No matter how good we have it, no matter how great you think your country is, no matter how proud you are of it, to be a citizen of this world, this country, this region, its values, its freedoms, its liberties, its rights, they are not at our home. Right? We could lose all of this tomorrow, and I'm guessing that most, if not all of us, would be grieved. Right? We would long to have it back. We'd probably even fight for that. But even if that happened, you have not lost your permanent home. We who believe would not lose our eternal, our most solid citizenship because that is to King Jesus and that is in a kingdom of his that will never fall and he will never lose you from it. It's a good and important reminder of what we, are, what we were hearing in the book of Revelation earlier this year. Right? Many are living right now in this age wondering, are we living in the end times? Are the end times advancing? Will we see that final day in our lifetime? And again, I don't know, and the truth is, none of us know. But even if the end comes, even if all sorts of terrible things happen on this earth, your hope is not to be in what can be lost or what can be hurt here. Your citizenship, your allegiance is to Christ. And so I understand, and again, I, I don't have an issue with Christians proudly singing whatever their national anthem is, or saying their Pledge of Allegiance, but I want you to understand and accept what the Belgian Confession sets forth in Article 37. It says, as a gracious reward, the Lord will make them, being the faithful and the elect, he will make them possess a glory such as a human heart could never imagine. And so we look forward to that great day with longing in order to enjoy the Enjoy fully the promises of God that are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Something more is coming. But that gets us to our final question. How do we do this? How do we practice heavenly citizenship now? And one instance that I really want to focus on this morning is, is what we did yesterday. When we pack all those shoe boxes to be sent off wherever the Lord wills and wherever Samaritan's purse finds reception for them, we do that knowing that they're likely not going to end up in some place that has people who look like us, that won't speak the same language as us. And I'm almost positive that they're not going to end up in our nation's shores. Right? Part of that ministry, that packing yesterday, and the collecting that goes on here all year long and everywhere else is kingdom focus. It's saying that we want to show the love that is prompted in us by God, and we want to share, we want to invite into the kingdom of God by the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the greatest story. We want that gifted to people around the world. And whether we're conscious of it or not, we're showing that the ties that bind us to believers of any place, of any language, any ethnicity, any background, those ties are stronger and they are actually more permanent than those who we would pledge allegiance to a country with. We have something deeper in common with those who believe in Jesus than we do those who share an earthly citizenship. And so let this be absolutely clear. I'm not saying you need to hate your country. I'm not saying you need to detach yourself from it or from any oath that you've sworn. But the kingdoms, the nations, the governments of this world, the kingdoms, the governments, the nations of man can and will all fall away. The kingdom of God will not. Your confidence, your, your comfort doesn't rest on the nation you belong to. It must rest in the Savior who died and rose for you. Right? That is what Scripture means when it says in places like Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. If you belong to Christ, then you are heirs to the promises that are in Christ Jesus, or heirs according to the promise. Our minds need to be conformed to that reality and to the promises that are in him. And so if Christ is first and foremost in your life, if he is where you most heartily profess your allegiance, do you show that? 
Do your claims, your faith, and your actions all match up? Are you living as a citizen of that kingdom of grace, which has begun and will one day be experienced in full? It's a better kingdom that can be experienced here. It's greater than any of us can possibly imagine. And so again, honor and respect the kingdoms and nations that we live in, but also fear God. Yearn for his kingdom to come with all who believe and live as citizens of that kingdom each and every day. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, again, we recognize that it is by your grace that we get to live in this land. It is by your mercy that we are in a place where we are given so many wonderful freedoms. It is by your grace that that there have been leaders in this country who have focused on you. And that how we've thought about our treatment of our fellow man as we think about what order and justice look like, that, that often it has been rooted at least to some degree in your word. Lord, we're thankful. And yet you call us to look ahead. You call us to push on and to strain for what is ahead, and that is your heavenly kingdom. You welcome us. You invite us. You command and instruct us to focus on you, our joy and prize for eternity, not just for our lifetime. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would work in each one of us that that you would help us to do this, that you would help us to hold both our earthly and our heavenly citizenship in the tension that you call us to. Lord, where we are able to serve these earthly kingdoms, we pray that, that you would help us to do that well and to do that diligently, and that we would do that in a way that is in accord with your word. But Lord, may you and your kingdom always take priority, that we might follow you above all other things, that we would not be distracted, that we would not idolize that which we have here on this earth. But Lord, may we use the freedoms that we have, the quiet and peaceful lives that we have, to further share your gospel as you give us opportunity to do that. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. At this time, our offering is going to be received, and we're going to sing while it's being received, O Worship the King, We'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 
one announcement before I have you rise for the benediction, and that is, uh, some of you know about this already, but, but you'll see a stack out on the entryway table. Um, these are some door hangers that we ordered, inviting people to come out to the gift on December 7. I know that seems far off, but, but days are passing quick. Uh, and with that, uh, these are door hangers. And so I invite you to, to take them, to pass them out around your neighborhood or around the apartments that you live in. Uh, if you are going to do a neighborhood, I invite you to, to let me know so that uh, we don't like hit the same area like four times or something like that. Um, I mean, that'd be great, but, but, um, but these are, they not only talk about the gift and show uh, an invitation to that, but they also include information about all of our services and events from Thanksgiving over to Christmas uh, and give opportunities to learn more about our church. And so if you are interested, uh, feel free to grab, again, the stack is on the Fellowship Hall table, um, and we encourage you to, to pass those out and to invite people, again, to share in the best gift ever, the story of Jesus Christ. Would you now rise to receive our parting benediction? Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Let's end our service this morning singing Living for Jesus. Thank you.